So uh, today we will be covering anonymous uh, communication protocols. So I, I have uh, given a reading homework. Uh, I have uploaded it last uh, last week. So if you read through the articles and uh, you introduce yourself with these protocols. Mm, so we could have a lecture in more like discussion format. Uh, what it was, what I was thinking. Yeah, but let's see. So uh, yeah, so uh, we have covered privacy uh, in digital world in in um, in our previous lectures. Um, but and here it's also important, like uh, as internet is is designed as a public network uh, and everyone uses it um, and but uh, but as, as a privacy here is quite important because uh, we uh, we give up uh, we give some of uh, some information or uh, when we are using this service uh, internet so uh, routing information is usually public ip packet uh, headers could identify uh, uh, the source and destination whom you are uh, communicating. Uh, yeah, so IP addresses are visible and so on. Like, and also, also lots of, uh, even the data itself, uh, when, uh, when going through the internet, uh, based on the protocols, of course, but uh, could, be, uh, uh, could be visible uh, to uh, eavesdroppers uh, or uh, the people in, uh, in the middle line. And and also, uh, yeah, machines or uh, uh, your, in your LAN network or, or like other routers may see your traffic. Uh, so basically, an, an observer in the internet can easily figure out uh, who is talking to whom. Uh, um, there is encryption uh, in a sense, like uh, the pro uh, the protocols like TLS or yeah. Uh, they uh, they they provide encryption for data, um, but that encryption hides uh, hides payload, but not uh, routing information, for example. Uh, and also, not uh, all websites are uh, are using HTTPS. Uh, some are are still using. I mean, they are without uh, encryption. Um, but as a user, uh, you you may want to uh, have some uh, some privacy and keep you yourself anonymous uh, when when using the, the internet. And uh, so from uh, from beginning of the internet, uh, that was uh, like people think about, thought about that and uh, tried to implement some uh, uh, some ways to. To provide uh, this service, so uh, yeah. So, uh, but but why do we need anonymity? Uh, here, the question is more uh, specifically to uh, to on the web, like for example, uh, why do you, do you need anonymity? You, you could chat, uh, you, you could use, use chat or uh, voice and share your thoughts. Well, my first thought is uh, mm -hmm. to, to buy uh, stuff that are illegal, like medicine, mm -hmm. or maybe to do some kind of hazard or all those, you know, illegal transfer, buying drugs, guns. And stuff like this. This is the only case that I'm thinking when somebody may need to be anonymous. And other way, I, I think that if you're, as long as you're doing legal stuff, I don't think you should worry, but. Yeah, that's, that's also like uh, uh, one view. Uh, and yeah, one of the crucial, uh, um, the largest use cases for anonymous protocols on the web could be illegal. But but there is a, uh, there are some other uh, use cases could, could be possible uh, like not illegal uh, but like more positive. Uh, do you have any ideas? 
uh, yeah, from your experience, you can you could share as Martina told us. Benjamin. Uh, I do apologize if this has already been mentioned earlier. I was a bit late due to moving, but um, uh, internet is a globalized is a global thing, and what is legal here might not be legal in, say, Russia, Middle East, etc. And I know especially that say gay people, etc., are prosecuted in. Are also prosecuted. Whistlebro whistleblowers, etc., use Tor VPNs, encryption network, encrypted protocols, etc., to also communicate. Also, uh, companies and businesses that has business secrets secrets to hide also use encrypted protocols to guarantee that their talks are uh, not intercepted or viewed by others. Also, you have communication say in the government etc that is also defined as secretive or classified or the military yeah that's really good points i mean tor was created by the um, u.s navy if i remember if i remember correctly yeah correct so yeah one of like you mentioned <clears throat> uh, good use cases <clears throat> for some people uh, for example that uh, to circumvent censorship in some uh, countries like political uh, some users might uh, need some sort, some sort of anonymous communication protocols. They need it in their life, otherwise they have problems. Uh, so it isn't illegal thing, but they to communicate with each other. Uh, for example, in uh, in Hong Kong, there was a, uh, there was a case last year uh, to to avoid uh, tracking from Chinese government or Hong Kong government that uh, the people. Uh, tried to use some chatting anonymous anonymous chatting tools uh, yeah so, so yeah that could be case for example uh, with, uh, the, anything, with yeah. the Hong Kong uh, as, as mentioned the Hong Kong uh, protest etc I do believe they used no uh, they started using non-encrypted or non uh, anonymous uh, chatting rooms etc but they were literally shot down by the Chinese government when they were trying to meet etc. Uh, we visited China one and a half year ago, and then I relied on using VPNs and Tor, etc., to access the normal internet. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, it could be also shut down. <laughs> um, I, I think they used Telegram or something. I am probably with VPN. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, they ended up using Telegram. I do believe they mm -hmm. started using Zoom, but uh, the Chinese government literally shut them down. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's the case uh, usually in uh, in some countries. Uh, and uh, okay, Marius, do you have any thoughts? They cannot. Yeah. So I I think the the narrative uh, that um, everything that is legal should be public is often uh, brought up, and uh, that yeah. has some merits, but it's not really true. Uh, so even in private life, we do keep certain things to ourselves and we don't tell everybody everything that we know. So, uh, you know, there is a sense of certain privacy, even if we have our normal social circles and social circumstances, we still cherish the ability for us to be able to tell something to one person, but that thing not becoming public knowledge for everybody. Um, and that has nothing to do with something be being legal or illegal. It is just kind of the way we operate in society, uh, such that we have some things that we don't want anybody to know, uh, some things that we might be a bit ashamed of, or kind of, uh, you know, um, some things that we are not proud of, or whatever. And, and it is. No, it doesn't go into criminality. It's just, you know, a normal sphere of life, um, such that we have certain circles of friends that we share certain things with, but we expect this sharing not to be public, uh, to go to everybody. Um, and it has to do with, um, with symmetry of information. So if everything you do and everything you say becomes public, then uh, for an outsider that becomes a source of knowledge or source of uh, influence they can extort on you. 
Um, and it doesn't have to be a government. It can be just uh, friends or, you know, people. Uh, so I, I don't think the narrative that um, privacy and protecting of some of the communication that we do um, uh, needs to go into the discussion of criminality. It has to, it has to do with us as, as humans um, because that's how we used to be. Uh, that's how you know, we operate. Um, so of course, privacy is helping criminals to do some criminal activities, uh, but that's a minority of where privacy matters. So we have GDPR, for example, and it has nothing to do with criminality. It has to do with protecting your right to personal information, to be kind of a guardian of what other companies like um, technology companies can milk out of your life. And uh, that is um, somewhat um, yeah, related. So I, I would you, you know, try to think of non-criminal uses uh, where that is valuable. And also, like uh, as uh, Benjamin pointed out, um, the uh, governments, the censorship, some some form of oppression or coercion, uh, sometimes begs kind of a reaction. And again, it doesn't have to be kind of a criminal. It it is just a way for people to discuss certain topics or to organize. Um, and that is another area where you know where privacy or some uh, privacy protecting technology is kind of important. So I, I, you know, ju just, you, you don't have to be an anarchist and you don't have to be, you know, anti-government just to appreciate some of the, you know, <laughs> imagine that you have telephones in the old days, which broadcast to the whole city what you're talking about, right? How would you feel? I mean, that's stupid, right? You would feel very uncomfortable with that, but that's how it is in digital, you know, form. Like Google is kind of watching everything you do with your Gmail and Facebook is watching every chat you have with all your friends. And suddenly we became comfortable with it and that's not right, like, you know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's a bit of a rant. So I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Martina, if you search for uh, use cases, you, you could uh, of course came up with such like illegal uh, use cases. That's 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 a lot of uh, information on the web about that. Yeah. And yeah, that's right, and and that is a bit unfortunate because um, this kind of a privacy uh, topics often get marginalized to discussion about criminality, and that is a valid point. I mean, it is possible for criminals to be more efficient or more effective if they have better tools. Uh, but that's just one of the use cases. That's only kind of a marginal use case of where uh, privacy matters. And I think privacy matters to all of us. Uh, and you know, we are not necessarily using it to conduct malicious things or do criminal activities. We just value the way of being able to privately chat with others or to have a, you know, an honest discussion with your friend or with your mom, right? And then it's not broadcasted to the whole world. It doesn't have to be public. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I wrote some of the uh, related to the web, actually. So, uh, some people might want to hide their identity and yeah, personal information. Some want to hide their transactions and browsing browsing patterns. Um, or uh, to avoid hackers and so on, like, and uh, to circumvent censorship. And yeah, this is such, such like some of the examples only. And you mentioned a lot of other, uh, yeah. But but generally, public uh, don't think about much about anonymity and privacy, uh, because uh, I think we have um, we have low. Uh, Privacy awareness still, but uh, but but it's rising, uh, and I, I I think like in upcoming years, uh, more people will be uh, will be thinking about these issues, and yeah. So uh, sorry.
Oh, okay, it's working now. So what is anonymity? Uh, yeah, uh, anonymity is is a state state of being uh, not identifiable uh, within a set of subjects. Uh, it's defined like that. So I think you cannot be anonymous if you are only yourself, because it will it will be tracked to one person. So yeah, uh, it's unlinkability of action or uh, and identity. So uh, uh, your data shouldn't be linkable. Uh, unobservability, yeah. Uh, but it could be, uh, I'm not sure, but it could be optional also. Mm. And any item of interest, like message, event, action, is indistinguishable from any other item of interest. Yeah, it's similar to the first one. Um, confidentiality. Well, what is confidentiality? Uh, is it different from anonymity? It is, yeah. Yeah, it is. It isn't the same thing. Yeah. Usually, confidentiality, from my understanding, it's like when uh, uh, when you uh, protect the data, you you are identifiable, but you you want uh, you your uh, your identity is protected or uh, from discovering by others like uh, yeah or yeah you, you could give more uh, correct uh, explanation if you have i would assume in the case of confidentiality and anonymity that it is for example if you go to veg or whatever veg knows who you are but if they want to sell your data or whatever to an advertisement platform or advertiser they don't tell the advertiser who you are but give the like this is a male between 20 and 30, and this is his broad interest, etc. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, usually in also in this, uh, when you are you know, when you fill up surveys and so on, like yeah. Yeah, so you're confident that Vega only knows who you are, but they yeah. don't share it. Yeah, this is of course more relevant in a medical data field or whatever, but yeah. Yeah, that was also my understanding. Uh, so, uh, how do you defeat metadata linkage? Oh yeah, it was uh, the question that even though if you have like a web page that doesn't, uh, where you don't input any data, personal data, mm -hmm. whatever, you can be tracked via just looking at where you're from, IP addresses, wh what you do, how you look, how you browse, what you search for, whatever. For example, Google can create a, um, an account on you just based on your searches that doesn't necessarily have your real name linked to it but it still knows everything about you yeah that's great so in uh w when you use just internet uh typical services uh, as i mentioned like you uh, you leak a lot of data uh even though not like personal identifiable information yeah uh, like uh, your role to ip address and also uh, you, uh, some traffic analysis could be made uh, uh, with linkages to other other usages, so yeah, I don't think you can defeat that if you if you don't use some specific uh, anonymous communication protocols. Yeah, I guess yeah. that metadata is kind of um, uh, broken by VPNs and Onion Network, etc., because that they mix the metadata between one another. I guess. Yeah, we will cover Onion routing now. Um, uh yeah and vpn we will not cover but vpn yeah it's i think many people know it and use it probably to cover the ip address so uh, let's discuss like what kind of attacks uh, we could have uh, Yeah, so it's specifically to the uh, <clears throat> routing of the traffic. 
So we could have uh, <clears throat> a passive traffic analysis, active traffic analysis, and also the nodes uh, uh, could be compromised in the network. Uh, so the, for example, uh, passive traffic analysis is when uh, when attacker simply listens to the network communication and <clears throat> performs traffic analysis and tries to deter determine some sort of like location, uh, some routing information, uh, yeah, or some application, you know, what you're doing in an application. Uh, in case of uh, active traffic analysis method, uh, this is like more like uh, attacker tries to alter the data itself. Uh, uh, for example, uh, it could inject packets and signature on it on a packet flow, and uh, so he can compare it in other side of the network, basically. So I mean, you, uh, it uh, here uh, uh, attacker not just listens but uh, also um, changes some data to to so so he can uh, use it and link it to others uh, other. Yeah, from the other side of the network. Uh, well, um, and we have anonymous communication protocols that allows uh, us, I mean, to uh, which which protects our privacy. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, which has some sort of mechanisms uh, to protect against that that traffic analysis. Uh, yeah, you can say that they work 100%, but <clears throat> still they provide some sort of protection. Uh, yeah, usually they are built on uh, existing internet protocols <laughs> like TCP and they use HTTPS, yeah. Uh, So we will cover some of them, like uh, Tor, Tor network, and also the second uh, uh, the, uh, that is Whisper. <coughs> um, so uh, and also we will briefly cover the mixed network. Uh, what it is like? We have uh, uh, we have mixed networks. Uh, they are also called mixed nets. It's also a type of uh, routing protocol. And uh, the main goal uh, is to uh, to create a uh, hard to trace communication uh, by using a chain of proxy servers uh, now known as mixes. Uh, so basic idea here is uh, uh, these mixers uh, collect uh, data from senders and uh, shuffle it and send to the to different addresses, uh, their recipients uh, in a random order. So, uh, the, the, the concept of mixed networks was first described by David Shaw in 1981. So it's <clears throat> it came like quite quite um, maybe yeah it's it's uh, so people were were thinking about this uh, from that time. So like uh, uh, it was I think applicable to untraceable electronic mail. So sending a mail which is untraceable. Um, and we have also onion routing. Um, this is uh, a bit different than mixed network. Um, uh, here we have a couple of routers. Uh, they are called onion routers. And uh, uh, the traffic uh, passes through these routers before reaching uh, the recipient. And messages are encapsulated in layers of encryption. Uh, uh, analogous to layers of an onion, so that that because of that it's called it was called uh, it was called uh, onion routing. Uh, so the difference here is that uh, in mixed networks, uh, the content of the requests are uh, protected even if the adversary monitors all the nodes in the network, uh, because as, as the mix mixer itself uh, shuffles it and uh, sends randomly. But in case of onion routing, uh, it doesn't. Or I mean, if all uh, all nodes are compromised, then uh, 
you don't have anonymity. Uh, so there is an assumption that the adversary cannot uh, monitor all nodes in the network. Uh, the second thing is uh, mixed networks uh, usually cannot be used for time sensitive data uh, because as I said, like the, you, you might wait some time um, to, uh, before like collecting some, um, some data from different senders and then you send it to recipients. So there is some uh, delay. Uh, uh, in case of onion routing, there is no need for such things. So it can be used for time sensitive data as well. Uh, yeah, so normally wait for quite some time before they start forwarding requests. Uh, in case of uh, onion routing, requests are forwarded immediately. So because of that, uh, uh, mixed networks uh, usually have high latency and only routing and uh, has pretty um, low latency and, and, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> for mixed networks, uh, uh, they are more applicable to, to basic things like chatting, uh, sending some um, emails maybe, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, and usually in onion routing, uh, the chain of uh, servers are, are like, uh, like there are lots of nodes and they span over across diverse uh, geographical boundaries. So, uh, so because of that, we assume that uh, adversary cannot monitor all nodes because it's quite hard. Mm. Yes, so uh, we will go through uh, two uh, protocols, Tor network and Whisper, and we will discuss their properties, uh, their use cases, and what are the barriers to wider adoption of these <coughs> protocols and, and, and the requirements of such systems. Uh, Tor project was initiated in 1995 by US Naval Research Laboratories. So as Benjamin mentioned, it, it, it was a military uh, finance project initially. Uh, yeah. The main goal was to design an anonymous communication network for military communication. Uh, then they, they open sourced it and, uh, and currently we have uh, many nodes uh, across, across the globe. Uh, so more than 2.5 million active Tor users uh, with 6,000 6, plus nodes. Uh, so it's specifically designed for low latency anonymous inter internet communications. As I said, so you can use, uh, they, they provide a Tor browser and you can just uh, just browse and use uh, that browser, quite user-friendly. Uh, it's freely available. Um, so advantages are it per, Preserve the privacy, so IP addresses isn't revealed. Uh, it, it's it's more safe and secure. Yeah, and uh, uh, but you need uh, but yeah, I will talk about that later. So it isn't encrypted in by itself. So data isn't encrypted. So you should uh, you should it, it's recommended that you should connect to only encrypted. <clears throat> websites. Best way uh, to fight back against browser fingerprinting. Yeah, so, so Tor network is... Uh, yeah, so just a comment, uh, the browser yeah. fingerprinting is what Benjamin was talking about analyzing the metadata. Such, yeah. or, or you mentioned that even if Google doesn't know who you are, you can they can profile the usage and they can profile the person behind a particular browser. So yeah. when someone is using Tor, that is in, almost impossible to do because uh, your connections are being kind of randomized, and then uh, it's not possible for. ISPs or for, I mean, for your ISP, it is possible, but for uh, Google's and, and Facebook's, uh, not for Facebook, it is also possible because they you are logged in. 
But yeah, if, yeah. It does not browse, for that. For yeah, exactly. But if you're browsing the web through Google, then Google cannot profile you uh, because you're sort of hidden by this anonymity layer, right? Yeah, and usually in Tor network, they, uh, people don't use Google. <laughs> That's right. They, yeah. <laughs> they use their own. Uh, I, I, uh, so I, I will cover it. I, I will show a little demo demonstration about this browser. Uh, so uh, let's discuss the architecture itself. Uh, so as I said, it passes through three uh, layers. Uh, it could be more, I think. Uh, and it's encrypted in uh, in each layer, uh, each each row, but encrypted by each router. Mm, and uh, in the right picture, you can see uh, that uh, it's encrypted three times uh, with each key and uh, above, I mean, wrapped by uh, Mm, by routers. Uh, so yeah, how it works. So first, a uh, client proxy establishes a symmetric session key uh, and circuit with only router one. So let's say entry node. Uh, and uh, yeah, here we use symmetric key encryption. Uh, so it means that uh, you um, So here, uh, symmetric key means uh, a private key is uh, generated and shared between two two users, and from uh, from this key, you 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 will have your session key, and yeah yeah that that goal is is the default search engine yeah that's right. So. Uh, after that, uh, client proxy extends the circuit by establishing a symmetric session key with only router two, uh, which is in the middle middle node. And then it extends further and you have your symmetric session key with only router three. So every, uh, every node will have its own uh, private key, which he can use to decrypt uh, the message and, and, and send it further. That way, uh, client applications can connect and communicate over the established Tor circuit. Uh, like, uh, what, what I forget to mention here. Okay, so we will discuss here. So there is a quite, uh, quite interesting diagram. Uh, here, uh, th there is a network, as you can see, and the person, and he, can, uh, he communicates and sends some data to to some website, let's say here, and uh, it it uh, the first router is is based on his ISP, and the, this is this is uh, this is a last or exit exit ISP, and we have uh, let's say we have uh, some data like the site you are visiting, the, your username and password, the data you are transmitting, the IP address or location. And the last, for example, let's say whether or not you are using Tor. So uh, uh, when uh, this this uh, graph shows uh, when we don't use Tor or HTTPS, like we don't use both, then uh, the data that, uh, that is visible to eavesdroppers are, are shown here. So almost like, uh, yeah, almost everything is visible when you communicate, for example, like, site, user password, and something like data location. So like they can learn uh, your IP address, they can learn your who, whom you are uh, communicating. Uh, yeah, so lots of personal information is um, available in this case because you don't have encryption, you don't, you don't use uh, Tor. But let's say you use uh, Tor, what, what changes? So here uh, we can see that uh, when you use Tor, there is a Tor relays like the uh, the first node, second node, and and the exit node. And uh, as you can see, your uh, your first node or ISP can still learn your location uh, because uh, yeah, they know your location or IP address, and they know that you are using Tor. But uh, for example, the middle one doesn't know anything except that you are using Tor, uh, the middle middle node. And the last node knows, 
I mean, they, they know that uh, you are using uh, uh, your recipient, like which website you are connecting and some data is also visible because we are using HTTPS here and in Tor network, the last layer uh, after the exit node, uh, the, 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 um, the traffic isn't encrypted uh, by default. Uh, so uh, if we use just HTTP, HTTPS, uh, we don't have relay nodes in the middle. And uh, basically uh, the recipient, uh, like whom you are connecting, uh, communicating is visible throughout the uh, connection. Yes, and location data also. But when uh, balls are on, like when balls uh, are green, uh, you can see that you can see that it's more like uh, it gives you more uh, anonymity because uh, except this node, others don't know uh, uh, don't know uh, like for example middle node or this node uh, middle node no doesn't know about your location and also the last node the last uh, traffic uh, connection is is encrypted here because you use HTTPS and because of that uh, they they also don't learn about the data like what you are sending. So it, so this is a basic uh, uh, a diagram showing what you can achieve with Tor and HTTPS uh, combined. Make sure though. Uh -huh. um, when you use Tor, etc., you will often meet, uh, see that a lot of websites block access for Tor users. Are the exit nodes uh, IPs public? Google, for example, will block you. Reddit will block you. And... Uh, yeah, because uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, they can see that you are using Tor and they can uh, easily block uh, this service because when using Tor, usually uh, you can't use some plugins and like media flash and so on. Like there is some limitations. Maybe because of that, they can they uh, some websites block you. So it might yeah. not be IP based uh, on an IP basis, but on a web uh, web browser basis. No, it is it is uh, both. Uh, so it can be based on the signature of the browser, but uh, more more likely it is based on the IP. And also, Google doesn't necessarily block you. Uh, but they block some, um, they block IP addresses, which make a lot of connections to them. So right. we, o we often get blocked from um, um, NTNU VPN because the VPN might have a single address, which they kind of uh, reuse. And then Google suddenly has a lot of connections from that address. So they say, oh, are you human? And then you have to kind of go through CAPTCHA. So that, you know, there are different mechanisms, but um, most exit nodes uh, are potentially um, known uh, because you can kind of interrogate the, the network and you can sort of map which ones are potential exit nodes. Right, because I don't know if, I assume there's a difference between setting up an exit node and a reload node. Because uh, I know that it's a volunteer basis service that people can set up their own relay nodes. Yes. But I know that, for example, there were a lot of noise a few months ago when Reddit just blocked all access from Tor. It's like you just get a 503, it's like no access. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So, which uh... means that they kind of need to have a registry of the exit nodes at least. But did they said that it was because of Tor? They haven't said anything, but for some reason, uh, Tor users just discovered that, oh, we can't access Reddit. OK. Yeah, I will check. Uh, because a third exit node uh, has, uh, like, has the recipient, like, for example, Reddit, it, it will be shown. So you can identify uh, which is exit node, uh, like, like service providers. And they might block based on that, like if if Tor user is kind of like connected to you and uh, to the website and so on. But uh, personally, I do, I didn't have uh, experience of that. So I 
I gave it a look and apparently Tor project keeps a track of all uh, active exit nodes. So apparently there's a list of all exit nodes out there, which means that you can in theory just deny users to use those exit nodes, I guess. That's correct. Block access. Yeah, so that's correct. So there is a list of exit nodes because um, this is a kind of a vulnerable part of the network. So if the exit node is uh, malicious, then it can reveal uh, some of the connectivity endpoint to where someone is connecting. And then if the entry node is also compromised, then you can have a correlation attack and you can sort of de-anonymize the traffic. So you can know who talks to whom uh, because you have kind of a both ends of the picture. So the Tor kind of keeps a list of exit nodes such that it can self-protect itself from being right. kind of in infiltrated by the malicious nodes, right? Yeah, uh, I know that that has that is the most common topic that gets brought up every time. It's like how secure is Tor? It's like, yeah, if the US military decides to run all the relay nodes, then you're out of luck. That's right. So yeah. So that is correct. So you, you, um, there need to be some building mechanisms for uh, preventing abuse from within the Tor network itself. Yeah. Right. I also know that, for example, the Tor network is also blocked in China and Egypt and other countries. So it's not, yeah, it's not encrypted all, all that's right. network traffic. Yeah, that's right. I am unfamiliar with the mechanisms because they claim they work in China, etc. If you do a lot of setup, but I don't, I'm unfamiliar with that setup. Yeah, I have also seen like uh, if the country you are staying blocks you, they have some <clears throat> some ways to, to 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 make you connected. But uh, yeah, that didn't work for me when I visited visited China. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, you mentioned about the weakness of like uh, Tor, and we will discuss it in coming slides. So if like this, uh, the exit node doesn't encrypt the data first of all, and second is uh, if exit node and the entry node are compromised and controlled by one user, then yeah, uh, they could easily uh, uh, track your view and find out. Mm. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is uh, a weakness actually. Yeah. So autonomous system if dropping, it's that it's just called like that. So if if an autonomous system exists on both path segments from a client to entry relay and from exit relay to destination, uh, such an uh, AES can statistically correlate traffic on the entry and the exit segments of the path. This is um, uh, what you mentioned, uh, Marish. So uh, the the second could be exit node if dropping. So just uh, monitoring the exit node. Uh, as Tor doesn't uh, by design uh, encrypt the traffic between an exit node and target server. Uh, yeah, if if they don't use end-to-end -end encryption such as TLS. Mm. There is also some uh, other attack, which was called bad apple attack. So this attack uh, against Tor consists of two parts. The first part exploiting an insecure application uh, to reveal the source IP address of or yeah or trace uh, a Tor user, and second is exploiting a Tor to associate the use of secure application with the IP address of the user. So. Uh, so it's more like an attack on application level. So if uh, application is insecure and reveals your IP address uh, by exploiting Tor, uh, you can associate uh, uh, with your other use cases, like you, you, when you use some secure application uh, with, with that IP address, uh, you can correlate and uh, that could be one, one possible attack. Uh, there are, I think, lots of uh, traffic analysis attacks uh, on the network. Uh, uh, I think we can have a break 
for 10 minutes and we will discuss whisper uh, after that yeah so uh yeah marish you can uh pause the recording for now and we uh, uh please come back at 14 and 17. Yep, started. Yeah, okay, great. So the second uh, communication protocol uh, that we will discuss is Whisper. Uh, so uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer communication protocol for decentralized applications. Uh, so a decentralized application uh, is an application that runs on distributed computing system like Ethereum. Uh, so basically Whisper is part of Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, as you can see on the right uh, corner, uh, the picture, uh, Ethereum has uh, basically three components. Yeah, I think you can say like that. So uh, first is uh, for computation, EVM. Uh, second is for uh, distributed storage swarm and whisper uh, is also there so it's it's for messaging uh, it's included by default in ethereum's uh, protocol package go uh, and okay we'll discuss the trade-off later so basically uh, how anonymity is achieved in whisper um, so the objective of Whisper is to give uh, some sort of anonymity to users, uh, which means yeah you can communicate without any uh, leaving any traceable evidence uh, to traffic analyzers uh, and no meta information leak. Uh, and for example, if you find some message in in one of the Ethereum nodes. Uh, it cannot be proved that the message was addressed to you. So it was designed in that way. Uh, uh, yeah, we will discuss how exactly it achieves darkness uh, in coming slides. Uh, for example, the principle is like uh, very, uh, quite simple. So uh, every message is delivered to every node. And uh, nodes broadcast that message uh, to neighboring nodes. Uh, but the thing is that the only recipient has a key to decrypt it. So basically, uh, um, all nodes continuously forward the message uh, to its nearby nodes uh, until the recipient receives it. Um, then the recipient even forwards it. So it's uh, because it's it's done for untraceability. But as you can see uh, here, uh, if uh, if uh, a node tries to decrypt every message that he receives it's it's a quite uh, quite a work and uh, because of that here's a trade-off like you you receive you receive privacy but uh, um, it, it costs um, so we can go through the message structure in whisper so we have version a version number of the protocol uh, and we have uh, TTL, which is time to leave. So uh, peers will automatically uh, uh, flash out messages which have exceeded their time to leave. Uh, there is a topic uh, which is used for filtering. Uh, we'll discuss it further in coming slides. So the topic is basically uh, to avoid spamming uh, and to, to make overall system a bit faster. There is a nonce uh, for uh, which is a random number for uh, proof of work, uh, and uh, sorry. So proof of work for spamming topic is uh, actually is for this uh, uh, to so every node should try to uh, all messages. It's it's a high computation, uh, so to avoid that to make it more faster we have topic and the data itself uh, 
which is encrypted payload of the message. Uh, so this is the basic structure of the messages sent in Whisper. Mm. And for proof of work, as I said, it's to prevent a node from spamming the network. So each uh, to before sending the uh, uh, sending the message, uh, uh, the node should do some proof of work. So uh, so that uh, um, like it it will uh, yeah it will, it's uh, it's uh, um, how to say. Basically, uh, it works like an Ethereum uh, in itself. So um, you uh, you avoid this uh, uh, denial of service attacks and like uh, lot, lots of spamming in the network. Uh, and proof of work, uh, if you uh, if you know it's uh, like calculating the hash uh, of the document, and we need to just get some uh, some bits um, uh, first bits. With zeros, for example, three uh, three bits, uh, uh, leftmost bits should be zero, and uh, for that you do some computation. So you uh, you create the envelope, and then you uh, it's uh, and you have a nonce, and that nonce should be uh, should be computed uh, before you reach, for example, this. And it's it's uh, it requires some work, uh, computational work. In that way, you cannot do it. Uh, you cannot spam the network every time with a lot of messages, because you have to do some work before sending it. Um, yeah. So uh, there is also some sort of uh, um, ranking. Uh, yeah. When. Uh, uh, when the node, uh, like when when you forward the message, and there is uh, some sort of ranking which depends on the like uh, proof of work uh, and also TTL. For example, lower lower the TTL, higher the priority of your message, and higher the proof of work, higher the priority of your message. Uh, so it it's it's a it's a factors that decide uh, the propagation speed of your message. And if your message uh, with uh, proof of work is like below specified threshold, it's uh, immediately rejected. And uh, yeah, so it, uh, it it gives some protection on expiry attack. Uh, for example, uh, making messages hang around for a long time by setting a long TTL. So it doesn't it will not work because of this ranking mechanism. Uh, so you, if you have lower the TTL, uh, you have higher priority. And encryption decryption. Uh, uh, basically, in Whisper, you can have both symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Uh, for um, for asymmetric encryption, it's uh, usually used only for one-to-one -one communication, and uh, and symmetric encryption. Uh, is one to many communication, and messages could be decrypted by anyone who possesses the corresponding key. So I, I discussed it in the principle. So basically, uh, only the um, recipient with uh, with a with a correct key can uh, decrypt the message. But uh, and nodes may have multiple symmetric asymmetric keys depending on on the connection. Um, yeah, upon, upon uh, receiving the envelope, as a node should try to decrypt it uh, with each of the keys, uh, and depending uh, depending on en encryption mode. Um, but basically, decryption is quite expensive. But we have uh, some mechanisms to uh, make it less expensive, maybe. So there is some probabilistic message filtering uh, in Whisper, uh, which helps nodes to de uh, determine whether it's worth to decrypt or uh, message or not. Uh, as the name says, it's probabilistic, uh, not deterministic. So, uh, so every node sets a filter, uh, what kind of topics they want to receive. And, uh, and they use uh, this filter known as Bloom, Bloom filter. 
it's a uh, it gives uh, you um, the answer whether whether some um, value is in in some set or not. But there are some false positive match matches are possible, so it isn't. Uh, it's uh, so false positives are possible, but uh, false negatives aren't. So basically, uh, with uh, like we can say like with very high degree of certainty, uh, you can identify whether the message belongs to your topic of interest. Uh, so a node will only attempt decryption if filter signals a possible match. So after passing this Bloom filter, for example, uh, nodes uh, will try to decrypt it. Uh, here it mentions like topic might reduce darkness, but uh, but it reduces latency and processor load. Yeah. Uh, we can summarize, for example, what whisper is good for and what whisper isn't good for. Mm. Uh, whisper is good for published uh, subscribe coordination signaling. Uh, it's usually for dApps, uh, distribute uh, decentralized apps. They could uh, work with each other uh, by, by implementing this pattern with this whisper. And of course, secure and untraceable communication is, is, a, uh, is a use case for whisper. And what Whisper isn't good for? Uh, as I mentioned, it's it isn't for uh, for low latency uh, real time communication. Uh, so it's like um, it isn't like a Tor basically. So you cannot use it for browsing. Uh, you can send some messages only. Uh, and these uh, data chunks are also limited, for example, to, to only 64 kilobytes in size. Mm. Yes, that's uh, weaknesses. We are sacrificing perf performance for privacy here. Uh, it, it has a higher high cost which means high network bandwidth usage and high computational power, of course. Um, yeah, Whisper isn't good for real-time communication and sending large data chunks, we mentioned it. Uh, barriers to wider adoption. So basically, a Whisper isn't uh, adopted as Tor even, like uh, it's, uh, it's uh, it's more uh, it isn't for users I think it's more like for uh, for developers who are aiming to create some decentralized apps and they can utilize Whisper in their uh, applications integrate uh, with APIs and so on so they can uh, so dApps will, will communicate and send messages in in a more secure way um, I searched for. Uh, for applications that are based on Whisper protocol, uh, there is one uh, which was called, uh, I forgot the name. Yeah, there is uh, one application. Uh, I, I could find, find only one application, which is more, uh, they have their uh, own mobile app and so on, but not much. So the problem here is uh, key management. Um, so Whisper currently relies on Whisper nodes holding on to user's secret key so that messages intended for, the, for users can be decrypted. Uh, so basically it means that nodes, uh, nodes control uh, user's secret, secret keys and uh, they use it to, to decrypt the messages. And it limits uh, uh, some, uh, some use cases, for example, uh, when when user want uh, uses some software wallet and who like which controls <clears throat> in cases when user uh, needs to be uh, the, in control of private key not the node uh, it li uh, this limitation uh, uh, yeah we have this limitation second is uh, 
disabled by default. So it's disabled by default uh, in Ethereum nodes. So when you install Ethereum node, um, it's initially disabled. So which basically means uh, Whisper isn't running on the majority of Ethereum nodes. Uh, but I don't think it's it's a barrier to wider adoption because it's it's it should be quite easy to enable it. But uh, the main problem probably is that. Uh, the, the, the weaknesses that we mentioned before, like high temptation, uh, high cost, uh, and only low data chunks can be sent. So it has, it's it's it has quite uh, limited use case. But still, you can use it to anonymously uh, send some data. Yeah. Uh, well. For Tor, uh, I wanted to uh, demonstrate the use of uh, uh, Tor and Whisper, but uh, for Whisper, I, I didn't install anything. So uh, we will discuss on the Tor now because it's quite easy. Um, well, let me share the screen then. Okay. Well, um, has anyone used Tor before? That is a risky question, I guess. <laughs> yeah, don't answer that. Answer in chat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Tor uh, project offers a browser. You can just download it. And yeah, let me show this. So it's quite easy. You just uh, Tor project. Uh, I think it's open source project and uh, they work on based on donations. And you just download the browser. Uh, for for example, macOS, as they have all all versions, they, uh, then you can. Uh, I I have actually downloaded, so I will just show mine. So here it is. So it's just typical browser. And when you use the browser, it already starts this triple encryption and starts to route you through prox Tor proxy, uh, basically. So you don't see much uh, what is in the background. Uh, but um, so uh, one thing is like, if you search, for example, for anything like NTNU, for example, so no, not not this. So they they don't use Google search engine. So they use uh, as Benjamin mentioned, they use this one, Duck Duck Go. So what it is? So this um, search engine is uh, more privacy preserving, uh, which don't track you probably. Uh, and they don't offer uh, advertisement possibly. Yeah, and uh, some things to mention uh, when using the Tor, um, you don't, you shouldn't install any uh, any uh, extension or plugins. Uh, it's better to not install them because uh, it might give uh, uh, give you, uh, give more information to to attacker or like yeah, eavesdroppers. So. Uh, It, 
in preferences you can choose uh, I have here. So there are three modes uh, of our operating the browser. Uh, so basically there is standard. Uh, all website features are enabled and there are some safer methods. So if you want uh, to be in the safe side, you should uh, you should use safer or safest modes. So it basically means uh, all uh, JavaScript are disabled, uh, and some some flash, uh, some scripts, uh, some media files will not be loading. So it's it's it will be limited, but it will be the safest one uh, because when you uh, Mm, when this, this, for example, some uh, Java Java plugins are enabled, they could uh, uh, they could avoid Tor proxy and uh, connect to the real internet uh, to get some data, and in that way it uh, reveals your uh, IP address. Um, and also, okay, sorry. In terms of extensions, uh, oh, yeah. So there are two extensions, which is HTTP everywhere. So if you enable enable it, uh, it will be uh, using only uh, websites which are uh, HTTPS based or so encrypted ones. And the no script is, uh, I think, it's for for that one, like um, disabling JavaScript based plugins and so on. Um, one second. Yeah, I think like uh, these uh, add-ons like uh, HTTPS on and NoScript are also quite useful for our normal normal browsers. Um, well. Okay, I found my slides. <laughs> so uh, yeah, <clears throat> so when you use Tor, if you decide to use Tor, <clears throat> You should keep in mind that uh, you shouldn't use personal accounts like a login to Facebook or some uh, other services. And you shouldn't uh, use your phone number, real names, or any links to your real IP. Yeah. And uh, it's recommended to don't like not changing the tour settings, uh, the default settings, because uh, it will uh, give more information to to eavesdroppers. So no add-ons, no external add-ons, plugins, uh, any customization, uh, you, shouldn't, you should avoid it. And uh, use end-to-end -end encryption means just uh, enabling that HTTPS. Mm, so only HTTPS-based websites are recommended to use. Because, because Tor only encrypts data between relays, as we mentioned, and Exynos uh, can collect unencrypted data. Yeah, so uh, that's it. Uh, any questions related to today's lecture? We could discuss it. You should also, if, if you're using or you should try to um, shut down the normal TCP IP connectivity on your laptop or on what you're using and only do the Tor um, as a proxy uh, okay. because you can have a website or uh, whatever you're accessing um, doing a plain IP request for a resource and then it will leak your IP address if you kind of allow that. So that traffic you should kind of filter out uh, on your um, on your laptop by default and only go through Tor. Um, so you don't mix the plain internet with the Tor internet. So if you're using 
Tor don't do a web browsing on the normal internet at yeah. that time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, personally, uh, I mean, I think you can use this browser, for example, in uh, public web files uh, in public places, uh, because uh, it could it, it it's it will encrypt your data with uh, with layers. So I think it would be more safe uh, to use a Tor browser in in public. Uh, public spaces, for example. Uh, I mean, uh, there are other browsers also for that, maybe, and also VPNs and so on, but just one way. Mm. Any other question? Mm. Um, oh, personally. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I interrupted. Yeah, sorry. No, no, you can continue. Oh, yeah, I thought I heard someone else speak, yeah. Uh, one of the things I commonly use Tor for is sandboxing of links, if I'm skeptical to them, because I know that Tor doesn't have any personal information on me. So if I'm sent like a shady link on Facebook or email that I'm skeptical about, I open up in Tor to guarantee that I don't find any personal information saved away in a cookie or something. Oh, yeah, that's great, yeah. Because uh, you will encounter with this kind of, links uh, in your life uh, where you were afraid of like whether you should open it or not yeah maybe especially if it's a um, real uh, what's it called a uh, short url where you can't really uh, inspect what is the true purpose of ah, the link yeah. i guess then you can open it in tor and then inspect it safely i would say still you it's not entirely safely but more safe than opening it somewhere you have your facebook login in another tab i guess yeah, other data. That's 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 one possible way to use it. Uh, other than illegal ways. <laughs> yes, thank you for today's lecture, everyone. Uh, it was quite uh, like lots of discussion and so on. It was uh, much better. Because I'm not also well experienced in this subject, so I decided to give you some homework before, so you could uh, learn uh, yourself and uh, conduct a lecture in more like discussion format. Uh, so thanks everyone. Uh, Marsh, do we have lecture next week or not? That's a good question. Let me quickly check. So it suggests that we do, but let me double check on the schedule. For me, I'm, uh, I think I have done my duties. <laughs> so I think uh, next week we have lecture probably. And after that, we uh, have Easter's, Easter holidays. So we don't have lecture. That's right. And we'll, yeah, we'll continue after that. But for next week, uh, I think there is a lecture. There is a lecture. Yeah, be. so for next week, there is a lecture scheduled. And I think uh -huh. it's uh, Xiang, who has, uh, okay. Xiang who has a lecture. OK. Uh, let me double check. Um, yeah, it's a coordination in decentralized systems. So maybe uh, maybe we do have normal lecture next week. Uh, and then there is Easter. And then we come back on the after Easter. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah, so, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so please uh, don't forget about lecture next week. Just I want to mention that. Yeah, that's right. And project submission is on 24th of April, yeah, isn't it? Project report. That's correct, yeah. All right, so thank you very much. Yeah. And I will stay here with the group that is doing uh, work with Benjamin. Um, so we have a bit of a chat on day project and then, yeah, we wrap it up. So I, I close the recording. Yeah.